Hello and welcome to Things We Said Today, our bi-weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles, collectively and individually, past, present, and uh, we're going to be actually talking about a few things that are uh, about to come out immediately. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop and Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything, and co-author with Adrian Sinclair of The McCartney Legacy, Volume 1, 1969 to 1973, and soon Volume 2, 1974 to 1980, coming out in December. I'm joined by my esteemed co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know is the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing, and a co-host of the solo Beatles podcast, Talk More Talk. He also has his own YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio, which has tons of Beatles-related interviews and things. You should look into it. It's a lot of fun. Hey, Ken, how's it going? It's going great. So glad to see you here. And my other co-host, Darren DeVivo, who has been a DJ at WFUV-FM 90.7 in the New York area for the last four decades, since February 1984. And if you're not in the vicinity of New York, you can still hear him and everything else at WFUV at WFUV.org. Hello, Darren. Hello, Alan. What's up, Ken? Hello, everyone. (laughs) So, um... Yeah, today we're going to actually discuss uh, sort of an, an odd little topic of uh, Beatles introductions. Intros, you know, if you if you think about it, when you listen to their catalog, they were spectacular at intros. Yeah. And we had decided to each choose 10. And uh, I mean, I have um, a, quite a long list <laughs> and I, I guess I'm going to have to... Um, choose 10 of them on the fly because, you know, limiting it to 10 is crazy. You know, they, their intros, I mean, if you, as I went this morning down song by song and uh, so many great ones, uh, they let us, they let us off easy on a couple of things where, you know, every now and then they would just go right into the song or have just a few chords like the intro to yesterday is really just, you know, chord being strummed hey jude goes right into it a lot of them go right into it but when they do an intro it really is kind of meaty but first the news with ken ken well in the last couple of weeks we've gotten so much news so many events uh and so many releases to talk about here um it's really incredible first the Beatles documentary film Let It Be is about to be streamed on Disney Plus, and that'll be on May the 8th. The film was digitally restored by Peter Jackson's production team, and we are awaiting news of any physical release, DVD or Blu-ray for Let It Be. Haven't had any word about that yet. I just happen to think without having any advance notice, probably there'll be something the last quarter of the year it would make sense to release something like this for christmas and i sure hope there'll be bonus material not in the actual film but as bonus tracks it would be really nice sure uh ringo Starr's new ep of four songs called crooked boy was first released on record store day alan's holding it up right there uh this past saturday it was as a marble ep on April the 18th, Ringo also appeared at the Amoeba Record Store in Hollywood with Linda Perry, who wrote and produced all four songs for the EP at a listening event to hear the four songs. At Amoeba, they issued an exclusive red 7-inch vinyl single. The EP comes out digitally April 26th, that's this Friday, and on May the 31st, it'll be out on CD and on black vinyl EP. Okay. Here's the marbling. I don't know. When I first looked at it, I thought, what's wrong with my record? <laughs> Someone sneezed. Um, the, record. the label, interestingly, has Ringo on side one, hmm. Star on side two. Oh, that's marble? That's marble vinyl? I guess. It looks, like, it looks like regular black vinyl with some schmutz on it. Yeah. <laughs> Sneeze vinyl. Yeah. Yeah. the modern way 
So did you uh, want to just say a few things about the EP? Sure. Uh, all the songs? Sure. Now, I have to admit, I only had a chance to listen right before the show. So I don't know the songs that well, but we'll each give our own impression for uh, how we feel at the moment about them. Now, okay. I think the, the, you know, as a whole, um, the EP is actually a bit different for Ringo. It's um, a lot rockier than we're used to. A lot more of a modern rock sound than I think we're used to. I'm thinking specifically of a guitar sound, you know, more sort of distortion and sustain and that kind of thing. It's it's just a different kind of sound than he usually surrounds himself with. And, you know, looking at the credits, I think there's actually a reason for this. I mean, it's produced and engineered by Linda Perry. All the songs are written by Linda Perry. Um, he hasn't done that before, done a whole EP or LP of songs by one person. Um, so that's kind of interesting. But so she wrote the song, she produced and engineered it, recorded at Greenleaf Studios, except for the drums, which were recorded at Ringo's home studio, um, Rockabella West. And if you look at the personnel, uh, you've, you know, Ringo drums and vocals, obviously on everything. Linda Perry plays bass guitar, uh, some synthesizers on some things. And otherwise there are, you know, guitarists and bassists, guitarist, Nick Valenci, bassist, Billy Moeller, another guitarist, Josh Gooch. And then on some songs on at Adeline, there's saxophone, trombone, trumpet, things like that. But, but, this basic um, group of, you know, Josh Goosh, Nick Valenci, uh, and, a, and a couple of other people, all kind of makes me think that Linda Perry recorded the backing tracks with her own musicians in her own studio or studio she uses and sent them on to Ringo, who added drums and vocals which might be another reason why this sounds like so different from the EPs that Ringo has been putting out lately. Hmm. Um, but, you know, um, the songs um, seem pretty solid to me uh, and Ringo sings them the way Ringo sings, you know, at this point we've, we've, I think I say it pretty much every time he puts something out, he has a, a very characterful voice. It's not, you know, Luciano Pavarotti, and it's not meant to be, and it, he sings the way he sings, and it, it it's very personable in a way and charismatic. So, you know, it's Ringo singing these songs by Linda Perry, and um, on to you guys. All right. What I would say is, first of all, and I don't, as a rule, like to review music after one or two listens because my opinions could change um and i think it's 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 not a good practice to just say how you feel after a few listens because you know like i said your opinion could change and I, what i would say is just on listening i would say i listened three times to the three newer songs um i'm impressed with what i've heard certainly production wise what I like most of all is that sometimes I feel like on a lot of Ringo's music, his vocals can be buried or there's too much reverb or he's too far away from the microphone. Here, it's like right in your face. And that's kind of what I would prefer um, without any special effects added to his voice at all. And there's a real live, spontaneous feel to these recordings even though linda perry had her musicians play everything beforehand it really feels like these are kind of like live takes in a way ringo's vocals sound really strong but they don't sound perfect if there's a strain on his voice he leaves it there so it kind of feels like you know this is what it was like in the studio for him to do it and i do like this this new approach even though it seems to me maybe ringo wasn't as involved with these recordings since Linda Perry and her musicians did everything and just mailed them to Ringo. Um, but the songs sound like after a few more listens, I would really like them. Um, the song going to need someone really rocks. It's really up tempo. 
I love that aspect of it. And the title track, Crooked Boy, actually has kind of like a country rock feel to it. I think if you slowed it down a bit <laughs> and you added more guitars to it, what you would normally hear in, in country music, it could work as a country song. But it does have a bit of a country feel to me, mm. more of a modern country feel. And um, Adeline sounds like a very commercial song. I didn't get a chance to look at the lyrics. I'm sorry. I do love February Sky a lot, especially the guitar playing on it. There's a nice edge to these songs. Even the poppier stuff have an edge to them. But that would be, you know, my impression after just a few listens. I, I think that I'm really going to enjoy this as I get more and more into it. Mm -hmm. Darren? Uh, FYI, Nick Valencia is a guitarist from The Strokes. Um, I'm not oh, too really? familiar. Oh, yeah. yeah, I'm not too familiar with the other guys, although it's quite possible they're also, you know, fairly well known session guys. But Nick Valencia, he's a stroke. <laughs> um, but anyway, I, I don't like being negative, but I also feel like I have to be honest. I like Crooked Boy, but uh, I'm not nuts for it for a variety of reasons that I'm trying to put my finger on. I think that Linda Perry wrote these four songs, which were not, at least in most cases, were not in Ringo's comfort zone, uh, main, main, mainly as vocalist. And I think they might have benefited, and I don't know this for a fact, I would was a little surprised to see if, if it was recorded the way we think it was, and Alan mentioned, and, and, and Ken mentioned, that Linda Perry and her musicians did their thing Ringo added drums and vocals, which is basically what Ringo said happened. I'm surprised that there is no credit given, say, to Bruce Sugar uh, for involvement on Ringo's end of things. Um, there is. You know, I, he's mentioned there because I don't have the physical record handy. I was going off some notes. Mm -hmm. uh, where, and his He doesn't get a co-producing credit, though, does he? Drums recorded by Bruce Sugar is all it says. I, it just seems as though Ringo's vocals and the drums, they, they don't fit right. I can't put my finger on what it is. On the first song on the EP, uh, which is the single, uh, which is February Sky, I feel that the vocals are overwhelmed by the guitars and the production. And Ringo is, it actually sounds to me like Ringo was shouting to be heard above uh, the backing of the musicians. Hmm. Um, elsewhere, I don't feel it's that drastic, uh, but still there, there's something that's awkward about a bunch of these songs. And I don't know if it's Linda Perry's writing style that, that Ringo maybe doesn't interpret as well as maybe someone else's, or maybe if he had, a hand at writing the songs himself, uh, you know, con you know, contributing to them. Um, this by no means. Now, this is like Ken said, a handful of listens uh, with my ears and someone else might pick up on other things and might not hear what I hear or might not agree with my opinions. Um, Adeline, I really don't like Adeline. It's kind of clumsy and a little goofy, that song. Um, uh I think the the best tracks on the EP of the four of them are side two. Uh, going to need someone. It's kind of a punky thing that's kind of refreshing to see Ringo doing something that's got some adrenaline running through it. Mm. I don't expect him to do that kind of material because I don't think that that is um, Ringo's style. I don't. I I wouldn't want to see him do a lot of that type of stuff on another EP or on on an album. But for one song, going to need someone really has a nice punch to it. And Crooked Boy, the title track is a cool tune, but again, there's something, it's like they forced, they forced Lego pieces to fit together to do something that they, for some reason, weren't meant to do. I'm not sure, and I can't help but think that it's Linda Perry's project handed to Ringo, and Ringo put his thing on it, and put it out as Ringo's thing, and something's not jiving there. Um, the best I could, uh, you know, kind of describe it. Uh, is, 
it's enjoyable. If you like what Ringo's been doing lately, you'll definitely find stuff on here that you like. It doesn't have to be the best of his EPs. It doesn't have to be, you know, up there with some of his best albums. It's a solid work. He gets a million thumbs up from me for effort at this point in his career. We say this a million times. At this point in his career, the majority of the musicians who are approaching his age have mailed it in. They're not making music anymore, or they're putting out an album once every 10 years. Uh, and Ringo's at it. He's not afraid to play it safe and just do what people come to expect. We get these releases and we go, yeah, it's Ringo, it's Ringo, it's Ringo. Then he throws this something like this at you to kind of stir it up and go, you know, even at this point in his career, you know, collaborating with an artist like Linda Perry, you might not think they could be considered apples and oranges, really. Um, a big thumbs up to Ringo for taking chances, doing something a little different. So maybe it doesn't, it isn't his best work. He gets an enormous amount of, uh, of, of um, points for doing this EP. Uh, and, and, and as is always the case, which, which Ken did uh, point out before, it's a, it's just a few listens, and it's not even in the best. I listened on computer speakers, who I just felt the whole thing was a little muddy. Um, get it on the turntable, or when the CD comes out in late May, or maybe the black vinyl. I, I still don't know about the you know the special vinyl versus black vinyl. Is there anything to anything with the difference in the audio? Uh, I would like to think they've mastered that by now because half the music that comes out on vinyl is coming out on uh, colored vinyl. I would like to think they figured out a way to put out colored vinyl that sounds as good as it could on black vinyl. But my initial my initial feeling with this EP is that it's a bit clumsy and it may be a little bit of an acquired taste. Uh, but again, um, it definitely has its positives. It has its 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 good points. Um, if I could just chime in with something that's semi related, uh, can you mention in the Amoeba in store uh, where they played uh, Crooked Boy, uh, the four songs, and they sold a uh, red vinyl single? Mm -hmm. uh, they did not sell out the red vinyl single. Really. Red vinyl single is going on sale. I shouldn't tell anyone so that you don't get in the way of me getting a copy. So I tell you what, after I get my copy, then no, I'm kidding. Uh, Amoeba's putting it on sale online Thursday morning. Uh, the 25th. Um, I would say go to Amoeba's website because I don't want to give any incorrect. No, I do want to give out incorrect information so that I can make no. Uh, check Amoeba's website and see what the deal is there. I don't know if they, they're they feeling generous or they press more than they could possibly get sell in the store. You know what I mean? Or, or it's just like, you know, but they have more and they're going to go on sale uh, on Thursday. It's essentially um, February Sky. And what's the other song that's at the flip side of the single? Do you know? Going to need someone. Okay. So a collectible to have once you've got the full EP. You know, the single is more something that you put in the, you know, in your record bin and show your friends when they come over and they think you need help because you got everything, including red vinyl Ringo singles. But uh, ultimately, I would I, I, I don't want I don't I really, really hate being negative. And I'm going to say it's a, it's a nice EP. It's a good EP. It's solid. Uh, I think it's it's not nowhere near as good as the last one. Rewind forward. But it will fit in very nicely in his catalog. Okay. Uh, oh, oh, and one more thing. I'm sorry. I just thought of one more thing. When the album Ringo 2012 came out, I remember a lot of people criticizing it. It's too short. It's too short. And Ringo couldn't even give us a, a short album of original material. Those covers. He redid one of his songs from the seventies. And yet, I love Ringo 2012 because it's got a punch to it. And before maybe it drops you off the cliff, it's over. And I like the covers that he did on it. And so while some folks listen to Ringo 2012 and, 
and 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 weren't nuts for it. I liked it, and this could be the same situation. Um, Crooked Boy might be something that you dig, and you know maybe I need time with it. So I definitely don't want to completely brush it to the side uh, and just say it's a it's a good work. And uh, let's see what the country album is going to be like later this year. Okay, I still think you know give it some time. You know, yeah. a week later from now, we'll probably have a much better uh, appreciation for the EP, hopefully, anyway. But I just have one question to ask you, Darren, based on what you just said about this being kind of clumsy. Do you think that Ringo is better when he's recording songs that he's written or co-written? Because Maybe. he's right home yeah. with those songs? Maybe. You know, that, that, that thing was special, that regardless of how it ended and why it ended, that relationship with Mark Hudson. Uh -huh. That really was something special. That when when they parted ways, there were, and I was one of those that was looking to hear something else from Ringo and felt that the Mark Hudson fingerprints were getting tired on Ringo's records because they were all, and then, you know, they were all a little too Beatlish, intentionally trying to be Beatlish. And then after Liverpool 8 came out and um, and why not? Which to me was a little a solid record, but was had its awkward moments. I thought, you know what? You don't appreciate the things you have when you have them. And I miss what Ringo had with Mark Hudson and with Gary Burr and that whole team, the Roundheads, because I think they worked well together. I think Ringo would right in there with these professional songwriters, and I'm sure Ringo learned a lot. He developed his craft more than he had ever had before. And um, I think that that could be one of the things that I that 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 leaves me a bit cold about Crooked Boy is that it doesn't have that collaborative mm -hmm. feel to these songs. If Linda Perry and him sat down and collaborated on uh, the lyrics or the music, I don't know how much Ringo chimes in with the music end of things when he's writing. I know he will, um, you know, comment on the lyrics, contribute to the words. It might have made for a more cohesive sounding batch of songs. And when I say cohesive, again, it's the way they're built, the way they sound once they're fit together. Mm -hmm. Ringo's drumming is top notch. He's still got it, even at his age. If you think that Ringo's become a lazy player, which some people say when you go see him live, you know, this EP should wipe that out. Ringo's. Ringo's playing, but there's still maybe it's the songs, maybe it's the way they, uh, the Linda's production and Ringo's tapes didn't fit perfectly. But I definitely think that had Ringo had some help or maybe collaborated with Linda on these four four songs, uh, it might have made them better. Okay. We could expand this whole conversation into an entire show, but we'll save that for another time. Um, but yeah. Uh, and then there are songs like the one that Mike Campbell just gave to uh, Ringo that everybody seems to love. And Ringo had nothing to do with the songwriting. You know, so it depends on who you're working with, I'm, I'm sure. Linda Perry's, uh, uh, I'm not that, that familiar with uh, her work. I know who she is. I know who she's worked with. Uh, and you know, somewhat familiar with Four Non Blondes, although I really don't, you know, it's been so long since I've heard stuff from from their albums that I don't really remember. But to me, Linda Perry and Ringo are kind of on the artist spec. They're kind of, there's, there's a little room there. They're kind of in different places. Whereas Mike Campbell and Ringo, I think, are, uh, you know, a little closer. But I love the fact that he's working with someone like Linda Perry. Because again, it's taking Ringo out of his comfort zone mm -hmm. with an artist that's, you know, got cred and is highly respected and goes against the grain. Um, I just would love to see Ringo wear Linda Perry's big hat. Anyway, that's uh, uh, that's that's enough of that. But uh, I give Crooked Boy a thumbs up, a crooked thumb. OK. I love seeing Ringo with his name attached to someone he's never worked with before. Yes. You yes. Know, Sam Hollander is another one. Um, so, yeah, give it a listen, folks. The new one called Crooked Boy. 
I didn't buy the EP because I'm waiting for the CD to come out. But I figured it would be online anyway so I can get to know it before the CD. So um, I'm enjoying it so far. Other releases for Record Store Day, the Mind Games EP, which had four tracks from the forthcoming Mind Games box set, which has a release date now of July 12th. Did either of you get the EP? I didn't. Darren? You did. I got both copies of it, both editions. Okay. I the uh, glow-in-the-dark vinyl, <laughs> of which I, that's, you know, I always end up losing out on the really rare and funky things, but my record store uh, had one copy of the glow-in-the-dark EP, and I got it. Uh... I think she, I think the I think she said um and a kudos to Main Street Beat in Nyack in Rockland County, New York. Uh I think she said she uh got Jennifer o, Jennifer O'Connor, the uh uh one of the proprietors of the store, uh said she got two of the glow in the dark singles, but I got one and a standard black one. I get the 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 other one is just a standard black vinyl. I haven't heard anything of the songs from it. Uh, but I, but I, I have them both, and that's going to be another case, like with Ringo's red single, red vinyl single. Once we get the box set, you know, this was always, this is meant to be a little teaser to play a few times over the next couple of months uh, till we get the box set. It's just, I think it's four songs, right? Yeah, I'm just curious to find out if uh, you are here. Take five is the same one that was on the Leonard anthology box set. Uh, and I'm actually on, on Talk More Talk, um, Joe Mayo was talking about it being something like 10 minutes long, <laughs> this take. So, And I didn't see it online on YouTube. And is I'm the Greatest the same one that's already been released on the Leonard Anthology as well? I'm not sure. Maybe some of you folks watching can let us know. I uh, heard that there's going to be a, 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 another EP of uh, remixes of the Newtopian International Anthem. So. Uh, it should be. Cut them off. The bonus track, Two Minutes of Silence. Yeah. You should have Newtopian National Anthem on one side yeah. of the vinyl. <laughs> and then Two Minutes of Silence on the and other. And then challenge someone. Which one was which? <laughs> which one was cleaner? Yeah. Did you get the Harrison uh, picture disc? <laughs> yes, I got them both. Okay, uh, didn't spin them yet. Uh, I'm turntable list at the moment. Um, they look really boring uh, when you're just looking at them. The whole thing with these picture discs is to get them on the turntable because they're zoetrope uh, yeah. discs. So, I mean, this supposed to create an image, I guess, as as they spin around. And they're all, all of George's records are going to be coming out, I right. think, in right. this format. Um, so uh and the packaging is like if you had the the 12 inch the front cover of the album mm -hmm. it, i think i believe it's the back cover of the 12 inch so that the front of the 12 inch you're allowed, you could see the record uh through the uh, cutout on the cover it looks like it's going to be a really cool set to collect expensive probably to get all of his albums in this format they also, I know they put out Blur's album Parkland, I think is a Zoe Trope picture disc as well this time out. But yeah, I got both of those where it goes. I sort of got them. <laughs> My store know? didn't have them. And, oh, really? Um, which was really disappointing. Um, I mean, you know, it, then I'm thinking, okay, well, how, how, how far am I going to go to get two albums that I already have multiple multiple copies of um and don't listen to that much i, I love wonderwall um and electronic sound i mean when i put it on it's it's okay but it you know it's basically practice tapes so uh really wanted them though just for the for the zoetro pressings and so when i got home i found them both on ebay and ordered them um and I, I i hate doing that because the sort of the whole point of record store day is to be able to get them at your record store and people selling them on ebay you always sort of assume that you know they were just 
speculating on the stuff and it kind of goes against the spirit of record store day. Um, but you know, what what, I, there wasn't sorry. any other way to get them. So what I do, and I agree with you, Alan, and I've got this, um, I don't this little paranoid streak in me about buying things on eBay. I think like there's some guy down in somebody's basement pressing bootleg copies of these things and I'm buying them on eBay. Um, like that's possible. Uh, but what I do is depending on what inventory the stores near me are going to have, they all go on sale online the next morning, 24 hours after the record stores officially are supposed to open their doors. In this case, I think Eastern time was 8 a.m. Right. Uh, 8 a.m. the next day, uh, they go on, they go certain vendors, certain merchants will sell them then online. Amoeba. The best I have had, my best experiences have been with NewberryComics.com. Uh, and they usually, Newberry Comics especially, will have, they'll have almost everything that came out. And if you act fast, like you're buying tickets to a concert that's a hot and not wait till they're sold out, you could fill in the gaps that your store didn't, maybe didn't have or sold out. Um, the one thing that was interesting is Crooked Boy I could not find online, which meant uh, I one store had it. One store that I that I looked online had it, but it was cleaned out out of other stores, which I was happy to see. I assume it meant that it was an item that sold well, uh, but I was able to fill in other holes with other bands and releases by ordering them the next morning. Um because I couldn't get them in store or forgot to buy them in mm -hmm. store. Mm -hmm. Okay. See all the tips you get from Darren on this show. That's Newbury right. comics. Yeah. I'm, I just ended up with crooked boy and um, was, was sort of happy to get it because I figured, well, okay, I'll have it in time to listen to for the show. Um, Did you go looking for anything else, Alan? Like what? outside of the Beatles? Was there anything else you well, there were the little singles in the in the little turntable. Did you get that? You were you expressed some interest in that. I thought when it was first mentioned, I got the turntable <laughs> and I got a set of singles. Did you uh, get Alan? I didn't. Okay. Could you have? Did they have it, Alan? Um, they didn't. Uh, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I wonder if I wonder if there were any of those left over that you could get if you wanted. Um, I, I I wasn't, you know, I, I, I'm conflicted. You know, I mean, I want I think I should have all the Beatles stuff in every possible format, but I don't know. Maybe it's time to draw the line. <laughs> it. I thought the same thing, but it's a really really nice item, and it's a cute collectible. And it's a Crosley turntable. I know Crosleys are, but it's a really nice looking item and a fun kind of thing to have. Um, a friend of mine who got them says the singles actually sound really pretty good. Yeah, yeah, I've heard, I've heard, I've heard video of them playing. I haven't set mine up yet, um, and they do sound pretty good. And they can be played, I think, on a regular turntable, which is pretty funny. Mm. Um, so yeah, I got the uh, the player. My store had, I think, seven record players, and, in stock. And when I got in the store, there were six left. Uh, but idiot here starts shopping through the bins instead of grabbing his record, his record player first. Just because I walked in the store, it's like one is automatically going to attach itself to me. And uh, the proprietor of the store said, "Darren, if you want to." Uh, turntable go grab one because they're going okay okay thank you i created quite a uh, traffic jam in my record store with what i bought this year i'm sure but they were happy to see you i think they might actually put my name on the sign of the store after saturday okay and other news about ringo there's more yeah. there's more there was one more that you didn't mention. What did I not mention? Do you want to real? Do you want to really get into the nuts and bolts of everything? About the Elton John Caribou? No, uh, uh, Joe uh, Joe Strummer and the Mescaleros. Okay. Uh, his album Dark Horse, um, on the Dark Horse label, the uh, 
uh, X, I always forget the name of the album, X-Ray Art and has a long title, Pink Cover. That came out. Yes, I got it. And uh, there's a new album uh, which kind of snuck out there, a, a, a collaborative album uh, bringing Danny Harrison together with Hun Her Two, who are uh, Tibetan throat singers and a third individual. And it sounds like a pretty album. I, I got that as well. That's on Dark Horse Records, too. And that, that was one that didn't get much attention in the record store day list. Actually, it's a funny thing because there's a podcast show that um, Paul Myers, who is Mike Myers' brother, does. It's a record store day podcast. And Danny Harrison was on there talking about that very release. And on that podcast, towards the end of the show, he mentioned that he's working on a concert for Bangladesh and living in the material world deluxe box set. So, yeah, Danny Harrison's keeping busy. He's he's pretty much the president, if you will, of Dark Horse Records. So he's responsible for helping to sign new, <clears throat> new and established artists. He's got his own music that he's working on, and then he's working on his father's archives. So, and Scott O'Rourke made me aware of that podcast. So good on you, Scott. All right. Uh, and the Elton John Caribou has the demo of Snookeroo on there, of just Elton on the piano. It's been bootlegged for many years. Yeah. But um, that's the 50th anniversary release of Elton's Caribou album. So Ringo has announced more concerts for him and his all-star band for a full tour. Nine dates so far, starting in Omaha, Nebraska, on September the 12th, ending September 25th, at Radio City Music Hall in New York City. Now, I've noticed, I just want to say, normally, when Ringo is toured with the All-Stars, the tours usually last four to five weeks. The concerts this year were much less. <laughs> there are only 12 dates for the spring tour and nine dates so far for the fall. So maybe this is the trend of what will happen, that he's doing less and less shows on his tours but um we shall see the uh, pre-sale for the radio city show i know is actually going to be tomorrow which is the 24th of april and i believe some of these shows will go on sale to the general public this friday on the 26th other ringo news ringo's 1981 album stop and smell the roses is being reissued on cd in what is called a Yellow Submarine Edition. This is, a, this is a limited edition, remastered version with all six bonus tracks that accompany the original CD, which was on the Right Stuff label. This is a vinyl lookalike compact disc. It's yellow in color on both sides. Amazon says the sound includes high-resolution remastering that will play in any CD player. The packaging includes a cardboard jacket, printed inner sleeve, and an OBI side spine. It's due out on June the 28th. This is from the company Culture Factory USA. The same company issued this release on vinyl last July. And Culture Factory USA is also releasing Ringo's Old Wave album with one bonus track. That's the early version of As Far As We Can Go on CD, also on June the 28th. Amazon describes it as a yellow CD, vinyl lookalike, compact disc. And this polycarbonate CD is black in color on both sides. So why is it saying it's yellow and black at the same time? I don't quite understand that. Those, but... those CDs might be repressings because I have them both. They came out last year. They on may be... Yeah. They might be... I mean, if we had an hour and a half, I'd go downstairs and try to find them. But uh, they they might be re, like reissues. You know, they might be repressings. But they do have uh, the playing surface is black. So that may be, you know, part of the maybe the color confusion here. Because if you look on Amazon, they'll tell you the release from last year. And it'll tell you that it's vinyl. They didn't say CD for last year. Yeah, I wish I could remember if they weren't. Were the vinyl releases, record store day releases last year, or were they just 
I don't remember now. I I'm wondering where, you know, but this, since I had the albums already, I didn't bother to buy this. Them. Might be, and please don't hold me to this. I could be wrong. These might be record store day releases from last year coming out to the general, you know, public coming out again. Okay. Quite possibly, because you're describing them, and that's a Culture Factory's company, right? Right. Yeah, they've done a lot of those uh, look-alike little those CDs where they reproduce the album and the disc even looks like a five-inch record. You know, I've got Hot Tuna stuff and Jefferson Airplane like that, some Christmas albums. But the Ringos sound very familiar, and I'm almost positive I have a, a copy of each. So. We'll find out more when these releases come out. The Paul McCartney documentary with Wings from 1974, One Hand Clapping, will be officially released on June the 14th. Some of the material appeared on official McCartney releases, like the Band on the Run uh, Deluxe Edition and Venus and Mars Deluxe Edition. However, the June 14th release of One Hand Clapping, which features the original artwork designed for the project, also includes a TV sales brochure for the unreleased film at the time, and it's the first time the audio for the film, plus several additional songs recorded off camera, have been officially issued. The vinyl version only will include a seven-inch single with six songs from what was recorded in the back of Abbey Road Studios, what's been bootlegged as the Backyard Tapes, including the songs Blackpool, Blackbird, Country Dreamer, 20 Flight Rock, Peggy Sue, and I'm Gonna Love You Too. Three songs on both sides of the seven inch single. You wanted to say a few things about one hand clapping, Alan? Um, I suppose, you know, it's one of the um one of the things that's covered in McCartney Legacy Volume Two, of course, because it's 1974. A lot of the things that I've been reading online are sort of treating this as if it was meant to be an album at the time, which it wasn't. Um, basically, Paul commissioned someone to film Wings because after they came back from Nashville, he wanted to see what Wings looked like. You know, he could tell what they sounded like, you know, after the Nashville rehearsals. Now he wanted to, you know, get a sense of of what the band looks like because it's an, it's still a new band they still hadn't toured um since henry and uh, denny left so originally this was supposed to be just a private film for him and not even a film just a you know takes of these songs so that he could just sort of judge the band as if he were sitting in an audience which is kind of hard to do while you're playing in the band it was recorded on Umatic video cassettes, which were sort of an early video format. Um, and that created a number of problems. You've seen, most of you have probably seen the DVD version of it that came with Band on the Run, and it's been out, you know, on bootlegs forever. And the video quality is not amazing. And that apparently is because of the way it was filmed. I mean, the, the the guy who filmed it, David Litchfield, was actually not a filmmaker. I think he was a photographer um, who Paul hired to do this uh, because they were, you know, they had a sort of developing friendship. And uh, Paul would occasionally say, um, you know, to people he was friends with, do you feel like doing this? And they would say, well, but I'm not a filmmaker. And he would say, that's OK. And, uh, you know. Then it occurred to both Litchfield and Paul that this might make kind of an interesting BBC program, you know, about Wings with its new personnel getting together, playing some of its hits uh, and, you know, mostly songs people know uh, and a few oldies uh, that, that Wings hadn't typically done before and uh or in the case of uh you know the backyard footage which is just paul uh things that paul hadn't recorded before like i'm gonna love you too so they decided that that it should be edited for tv 
and they realized that Umatic was not really editable in that way. So it had to be transferred to film and then the film had to be edited. And so we're starting already a couple of generations down. Uh, and they brought it to the BBC and the BBC said, are you insane? We can't show this. So um, it's sort of sat in the vault all this time, uh, apart from leaking out for bootlegs and things like that. But it's, it is kind of odd that they're making such a big thing about it because it wasn't a huge thing at the time. It, you know, it was, as I said, it started out just as a way for Paul to see what the band looked like. It w was not uh, originally intended to be seen by anybody except Paul and the band. And once they tried to get it out there, uh, nobody wanted it. So now we'll we'll have a listen to the tracks. They're they're not putting out the video again. Although um, I gather the video will MPL is going to put it on YouTube itself. So it's possible that they'll have have a bit you know better quality than we've seen. But we saw what MPL put out on the DVD for a band on the run, and and that was not spectacular quality. So. Uh, maybe that's why they're not also putting it out as a DVD because they've already sort of done it. David Litchfield died actually, I think, a few months ago. It, it was it was relatively recent, and uh, after he died, they actually I think found more material. I mean, when we we had interviewed him, he told us there was no more material. There, there were no outtakes. Uh, the video outtakes had all been thrown away. But that turns out not to be true. MPL has quite a bit more than we were aware of. So mm. we'll see what he puts on YouTube. Maybe, Maybe David wasn't aware of how much NPL had. It's possible. It's possible he gave it to them and then forgot about it, or um, it may have been, some of it may have been found stored in his house after he died that he had forgotten about. But anyway, we'll see. Yeah. And maybe Paul feels like these are really good performances worth putting out and it's also this year the 50th anniversary of when it was yeah recorded so not bad performances and, and the fact is that um you know they feature jeff Britton on drums um mm. it's you know shortly after nashville and before the recording of venus and mars and it was sort of during the venus and mars sessions that jeff ended up leaving uh so this is actually this actually extends considerably the body of work of that version of Wings with with Jeff on drums. And uh, he was pretty good. So this might be an opportunity for people to reevaluate whatever they think of Jeff, because otherwise we have, you know, maybe uh, a, a few tracks on Venus and Mars and Junior's Farm. There's not a lot of of Jeff drumming, but now there will be quite a bit more. Hmm. Okay. I'm really excited about this because in 2024, even though it's not really new, there's a new Wings album coming out. <laughs> and I, I just get a kick out of that. That's that's who would have thunk it. Uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to this. I just find it a little odd that, you know, audio tracks have come out in piecemeal. <laughs> You know, between Bad on the Run and Venus and Mars and you know they're all worthy tracks and everything and now is everything from those sessions on here audio wise? I don't think so no. Okay so still we don't have everything right but it's a lot of good stuff though uh, Yoko Ono will be receiving the Edward McDowell medal in a ceremony this summer in New Hampshire one of the United States' leading artist residency programs, McDowell has awarded a Lifetime Achievement Prize to Yoko. The groundbreaking artist, filmmaker, and musician is the 2024 recipient of the Edward McDowell Medal, an honor previously given to Stephen Sondheim and Toni Morrison, among others. Uh, McDowell uh, board chair uh, Nell Painter said in a statement on Sunday, there has never been anyone like her. There has never been work like hers. Over some seven decades, she has rewarded eyes, provoked thought, inspired feminists, and defended migrants through works of a wide-ranging imagination, enduringly fresh and pertinent, 
Her uniquely powerful oeuvre speaks to our own times, so sorely needful of her leitmotif, peace. Sean Lennon said in a statement that the medal was an incredible honor. The history and list of past recipients is truly remarkable. It makes me very proud to see your art appreciated and celebrated in this way, Sean said. Congratulations to Yoko for that. Uh, according to DMME.net, Eric Clapton will have a new live album coming out called To Save a Child. This is from a concert he gave to an intimate audience in London last December. And the concert as well as this release is said to benefit the children of Gaza Strip. On the live album, he covers George Harrison's Give Me Love, Give Me Peace on Earth. And he's also accompanied on this live performance by Danny Harrison. So that is coming out in July. This new live album from Eric Clapton. Thanks to Tom Brennan for that. There will be an all new documentary film on the Beach Boys premiering on Disney Plus called simply The Beach Boys. And its trailer includes appearances and commentaries from Paul McCartney, Don Was, Ryan Tedder, Hal Blaine, plus new and archival clips from members of the group. And that will start airing on May the 24th. Thanks to Scott O'Rourke for that information. A few more things. Graham Goldman will have a new solo album coming out called I Have Notes. Coming out on July the 5th, the 10CC musician who also was a part of Ringo's All-Stars a few years back will also have Ringo playing drums on one song called Couldn't Love You More, which is said to be inspired by the Fab Four. Other stars collaborating with Goldman on the album include Brian May, Albert Lee, and Hank Marvin. 10CC, by the way, are embarking on a new tour, of which Graham is the only original member. Again, thank you, Scott O'Rourke, for this information. I think we're going to hire Scott O'Rourke and uh, send you down to AAA, Ken. He'd be quite <laughs> happy for that, I think, Scott would. Um. There'll be a George Harrison tribute. You've heard me mention this on the show for years, formerly called Harry Fest. It's taking place again this year, November 2nd, at White's in Westport, Massachusetts, uh, starting at 3.30 p.m. So those of you in the New England area who look forward to that, it's coming again on November the 2nd. And a reminder, speaking of George Harrison, Let It Roll, Songs of George Harrison, is being reissued coming out this Friday, April 26th. And that's all the news we have this time. Okay, then. So let's talk about Beatles intros. As I had said, we we had decided to each choose 10 because we like to be ridiculously restrictive to ourselves, but we almost always cheat by having rushers up and all that kind of stuff. We'll, we'll see if we get away with that this time. Um, who wants to start? Ken? Well, I broke it down to three different types of intros. Mm -hmm. Iconic guitar or piano intros with riffs. Mm -hmm. Songs that have separate intros from the rest of the song. Mm -hmm. And songs that start cold. That just start with vocals. Because I think that those are just as important in their own way. Does it count as an intro if it hasn't got an intro? Yes, that is the intro. <laughs> because if the first thing you're hearing is the vocals and the mm -hmm. vocals really suck you into the song and grab okay. your attention, mm. I, I think that it's just as See, I, I used I used the lack of a, of a of a formal intro as a way of cutting down the list I had to choose from. But <laughs> you did it a harder way. OK, let's see who you got. <laughs> well, you know, I had 13 just for iconic guitar or piano riffs. So I'm just going to randomly pick some. I'm only going to mention like three to five. And the first three are, are absolute musts. I had to put Day Tripper in there. And I feel fine. They both start out with iconic uh, guitar riffs. And the songs are built around them. As soon as you hear it, they're such an important part of the song. You know, the, the arrangements of Beatles songs are very important, just like the quality of the songs are. And... Um, the important thing about I Feel Fine and Day Tripper, I always link the two of them together, is that John Lennon said in his very famous interview with Dennis Elsis in 1974 when he was promoting Walls of Bridges, that I Feel Fine came from 
the song Watch Your Step from Bobby Parker, the R&B artist. And if you listen to that record, you can always go on YouTube and listen to it. You're going to hear a riff that's almost the same, not completely identical to I Feel Fine. And there is a moment in that song where you're going to hear something that is pretty close to the Day Tripper riff. It only happens once. But you can hear both of them in that one song. Mm. But, um, you know, so much has been made about I Feel Fine and the fact that you hear the, the reverb at the very beginning of the song, which was yeah. all a mistake in the studio to begin with, but they kept it anyway. And then that riff, it's so much an important part of the song. You know, I had to include that as far as iconic guitar riffs, those two. And I also had to include that opening chord of A Hard Day's Night. You know, Alan is saying, I had that one. I knew it was going <laughs> to Damn that, Ken. <laughs> um, so maybe instead of mentioning all 13, I'll mention a few of piano uh, um, intros that I think are very important. Um, I put in Lady Madonna. That's so much a piano-driven song. Um, Martha, My Dear. There's a lot of people who I always remember Paul saying in concert when he does Blackbird, how many of you learn Blackbird on guitar? Like, you know, it's such an essential song. And there's a lot of people that try to learn Martha, my dear, by ear or whatever. That's one of those songs, Beale songs that when you're playing piano or studying piano, you want to learn Martha, my dear. Um, as well as some um, Obla oh, Di Obla oh, Da. You know, it's such a lively introduction I always felt it was kind of odd that John played it since apparently he didn't like the song. And yet right. yeah. during the song, he's he's having a good time and he's laughing along with it. But um, there's so many other ones. I'm not neglecting those, but we're kind of limiting, if we can, to just 10. Um, as far as songs that have separate intros, this is something that I always remember Paul talking about when Kisses on the Bottom came out, that... Uh, the Beatles or he and John used to study songs pre rock and roll. And a lot of songs had introductions that were so separate from the rest of the song. He never heard it repeated ever again. And I thought that was a very cool thing. And, you know, a little more effort even put into the song for that reason. And if you listen to kisses on the bottom, there's an introduction for the Irving Berlin song always, which best illustrates that. I think. But um, with the Beatles, I would definitely go with If I Fell, which is, you know, completely separate from the rest of the song. And I think it's a brilliant introduction that flows right into the verses. Okay. Um, probably I would say um, Here, There, and Everywhere is in the same category because, again, the introduction you'll never find in the rest of the song, but it goes right into the first verse. It just flows so naturally. Um, and I wanted to put some songs that start off cold. Because sometimes when you just hear a vocal, and especially if it's vocal without even hearing guitars or piano, it just it captures the song so well. And, it, and you know, it's such an attractive part of the song and makes your ear listen even more, especially if it's lengthy, a little bit lengthy. And even though there's so many of the songs I can mention here that do that, none do it better than Mr. Moonlight. Mr. Moonlight is a song that everybody criticizes. It's supposed to be the worst song the Beatles ever did. Well, it's also one of the best vocals John ever did. And to start off the song the way he did, completely a cappella, nothing else that screaming vocal so powerful you know i love that <laughs> it makes it you know such a vital part of the overall recording of the song i would also put all my loving in that category as soon as the song leaps right in with paul's vocals like that it sucks you right into the song you know and i know that there's the canadian version of all my loving with the hi-hat intro which I don't know how many people even care about that, but does nothing for me, really. To start just with Paul's vocals like that, I think there was a really good reason why that was the first song the Beatles did on the Ed Sullivan Show. You know, it really attracts the listener and um, 
you know, when you start right off with the song like that and it captures and it grabs your attention, it's it's doing its job. Um, there's one, two, three, six other songs I can put in that category, but I'm going to put um, It Won't Be Long in there. Mm -hmm. It Won't Be Long has no intro other than John's vocal in the very beginning and then the other Beatles harmonizing with him after that. And it makes it, uh, you know, also an ideal song to kick off with the Beatles with. I know it's debatable when you have Meet the Beatles versus With the Beatles. Would you rather have I Want to Hold Your Hand or would you rather have It Won't Be Long? And they're both so perfect for songs that kick off the album. But mm -hmm. it does work when you start off a song like It Won't Be Long, so up-tempo, so catchy, starts right off with a powerful vocal right there. And um, so I mentioned three there with songs that start cold. Um, I think I put 10 in. I think I just mentioned 10 so far. So we can stop at that. And if we want to have some honorable mentions later. Okay. Okay, Darren. All right. Um, I found it. I mean, it was hard to kind of try to keep it to 10 or whatever number uh, because there are so many iconic, which you pointed out, um, uh, 10. Uh, there are so many iconic uh, openers that the Beatles have. Um, and especially early on when the, the, uh, the, the, the slate was bare, there wasn't a lot of songs, there weren't a lot of artists and things tended to be kind of formula formulaic back then. And the Beatles came and they innovated everything. They changed everything, you know, including the way songs can begin. Uh, and so there were so many early on iconic intros to Beatles songs early on that it's, I think it's easy to look past them today. Uh, and I try to re-examine things that I, I, that maybe I don't pay attention to anymore. So my list is kind of all over the map. They're, my list is as I thought of them, not in any given order. Um, and it's a combination of iconic classic intros that everyone knows that you could do a name that tune in one note and they would know immediately what the song is going to be. Um, uh, introductions that were innovative in that, that they broke ground as simple as they might've been to accomplish. They weren't, nobody was starting songs off like this. So my minor picks that kind of include uh, a mix of, of both areas, starting with revolution. I mean, that overdriven guitar uh, that you could play a second of it and everyone's going to know that's Revolution mm. from the Beatles. That, uh, that uh, you know, overmodulated guitar, just nobody sounds like that. Even some of your best heavy rock and heavy metal bands cannot uh, come up with that opening, that... Uh, revolution has the kind of strange uh psychedelic uh introduction to tax man uh it's it's paul i think doing the count in uh if i'm not mistaken i used to think it was george and i could be wrong it could be fred down the block but whoever's doing the count in just the way they do it with background noise session studio noise in the background Somebody kind of counting down, somebody yelling go out in the background, boom, the song starts. Clever way to open up an album, an album like Revolver. Yet again, they've opened albums with and opened songs with count ins. But they didn't do it like Taxman. And so they were still kind of reinventing the wheel that they invented just a couple of years earlier. That makes sense. See what I'm saying? You see what I'm saying with that? Of a tax man. I feel fine. That's an obvious one. Uh, the feedback might have been an accident, but who opened songs like that back in 1964? Hmm. Or today? It's not a practice that is common. I mean, I don't think, but that's just a, that, that simple mistake that dunk, 
on the guitar that feeds back uh, some of the some some of the great innovations in art were mistakes. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to come back to that uh, in a moment because I don't want to throw myself off here and skip any songs. Uh, I feel fine. Um, back in the USSR, yeah, I know it's just a sound effect fading in, but sitting at the beginning of the White Album, you know, there had to be so much anticipation when the White Album came out, especially those folks that didn't get Magical Mystery Tour as an album and had to wait a year and a half for the follow-up to Sgt. Pepper. And you wait a year and a half and you get this anti-pepper. You get this white cover. You get an apple on the label. It's 30 songs. It's a double album. There have been a couple, but that's all there have been in pop music. And the moment you're going to put the, have, this, have this experience of listening to this, the Beatles have done it again. You could just look at it and nobody's put out records that look like this. You put it on. And here comes an airplane fading in the sound effect. It's just a, a mesmerizing, uh, great little trick to pull you in. And you'll always remember the White Album opening with that airplane at the beginning. Uh, I saw her standing there, the classic count, and um, um, kind of straightforward, but man, if that doesn't get you juices before the first notes hit flowing, uh, Paul's counting. Mm. Uh, I saw her standing there, and this is still again 1963. I can't think of too many pop songs, I, I, you know, hits, well known songs that open up with something that gets your blood pumping before a single note is played on an instrument. And also, that was, um, you know, like a, a certain number of their intros, that was a, a, an intro for another take that they just liked the way he counted it in and yeah. took that and fastened it onto the take that they actually used. I mean, it, it really goes to show that you, it's, 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 it's something that they did, an accomplishment of theirs that gets lost today. But they, I mean, every little thing about what they did, the Beatles, was innovative. From putting noise in the inner groove of side two of Sgt. Pepper to the way they designed their album covers that today you look at and you're like, so. But back in the data, I mean, 63, you're opening up your album with one, two, three, four, you know, and it's wow. Pay attention to these guys. Uh, it's all too much. Again, sort of like I feel fine with the feedback. It's one of my favorite Beatles songs ever. But I just love that the little John. I mean, Lennon just kind of it's all too much, and boom, that feedback thing, and the overdrive, and the and the and 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 you know all the crazy things that happen, all the colors go flying around, and the feedback. It just it's the epitome of psychedelic Beatles at their best, and uh, and a great part of the Yellow Submarine film, the whole sequence where it's all too much. Um, and two songs that I always think of together as one, and one of the reasons could be because they start the same way. No reply and I'm a loser. You start right in the middle of the song. It's almost like the Beatles didn't even bother writing a beginning of the tune. John comes right in, here's what the song's all about. No reply and, and I'm a loser. Uh, right off the bat, you know, whoop, this guy's a loser. Because it's the first things he says, and and no reply. It happened once before. It's clever, ballsy ways to open two songs, and I think they're side by side, if I'm not mistaken, on Beatles for Sale. Yes. So I mean, that's even that way, even presenting them that way. You know, on an album, you put the album on, you get one boom vocal, second song boom vocal. Um, eight days a week because of the fade in, hmm. a simple but effective and unusual. Um, the introduction to come together. Uh, I mean, there's another one that I'll play you a second of this. Tell me what it is. You know, Ringo's, you know, Ringo's, uh, uh, folks who criticize Ringo's drumming skills, listen to the drumming on the intro to come together. 
Um, Lennon saying shoot me, which really just comes off as shoot. it's just a cool effect. You couldn't, if you were in a band and you were trying to start off a song with something, let's put a really cool beginning on it. You couldn't do that if you tried. Uh, open up a uh, open up a song like Come Together and it's sort of a sinister song to kick off the Abbey Road album, which isn't a sinister album, but it's kind of a just, you know, cool way to kick off an album. It won't be long for the same reasons you mentioned, Ken, coming right out, boom, with the vocal Hmm. first song. Um, Right. It's the first song I said before I saw her standing. There was a first song on. Please, please me. The first album. The first album. That's that made me take my notes here. And it won't be long being the first song on with the Beatles, hmm. the second album. But again, jumping right in uh, on a first song, first thing you hear, it won't be long. It just adrenaline. Uh, and at the end, one of my favorite Beatles songs of all time and one of their great riffs. And your bird can sing. That guitar riff. Um, and, uh, you know, just that's another one of those. And they're laughing at me now. No, because Alan's and, thinking that's and laughing right. because he can tell that I had it on. <laughs> and, and I was going to put rain on there as well, but then the list was getting too long. But for the same reason as Anya Bird can sing, uh, the drums and the guitar riff to rain, another iconic intro for the Beatles. And with that, I will shut up. By the okay. way, I'm just going to throw this at the two of you. <laughs> Did you mention it's all too much? Hmm. know what's actually said at the very beginning there because i don't it sounds like to your much it is what it sounds like i thought i think it just sounds like somebody uh just a a clipped edit at the beginning of john saying it's all too much um whether he meant that to be something that was going to be part of the song or the mic or the mics and the tape machines caught him saying it on a live, live mic and they left it, hmm. you know, but I'm pretty sure he's saying it's all too much, you know, just, and they left it because it sounded neat going into the first note on the guitar. Well, you know, since you can isolate things now, mm. <laughs> it should be easy to find out what's actually said there in the very beginning. Oh, yeah. Put that on the project list. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And also with tax man, do you think that's Paul at the very beginning with the word too? Because it could also sound like John there. And, and, and I've always thought it was George, but I I think so. I heard something that you know recently that said that that's Paul. All right, Alan. Hey, so um, you know, I made myself a bunch of rules as as a way of trying to limit the list to choose from because I knew that ten was a ridiculously small number, um, and so. What I did is I excluded songs that, for instance, the intro was a riff. So there you got Day Tripper, you got I Feel Fine, you got Birthday. And it's not because I don't think those are great intros. It's just because I needed a rule. Um, so so those are gone. Um, I also tried not to choose ones where the intro was also the chorus. So She Loves You is like, a spectacular intro. I mean, that thing comes on, you listen, yeah. you know, I mean, it pulls you right in, but it is the chorus of the song. Um, and that's pretty much the same for, well, I'm a loser in a way. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of them. Uh, and then I didn't do any that go right into the song like Hey Jude or All My Lovin'. Hmm. Um, so that was really just a, a way of trying to make the list manageable. And even then I couldn't quite manage it. Ken mentioned Here, There and Everywhere as an example of the Beatles using the sort of old fashioned song intro uh, hmm. kind of thing, uh, like Paul talks about in, in Kisses on the Bottom. And so that helped me eliminate that one from my list. So instead, I'm going with, do you want to know a secret, which also does that, that functions in exactly the same way. 
it's sort of a semi spoken intro that then leads into the song. I did also choose Hard Day's Night. And I was thinking, you know, Edward, does, does, does this count as an intro? It's only one chord, but it's a chord that people have been spending decades trying to figure out the voicings of and, and what exactly it was. And it is so compelling a chord that that thing explodes at you and you're pulled into the song. Also a good way to start a film, it turns out. Then I'm skipping ahead. I had, you know, eight days a week um, and Darren had mentioned it, um, but also um, I could just say as a footnote that the alternate intro, you know, when they uh, had a completely different arrangement of it that ended up on uh, Anthology, I guess it would have been Anthology 1. It's, you know, a totally different kind of intro and I really love that intro too. Um, but nevertheless, skipping ahead to I've Just Seen a Face. Mm. You know, if we're going to um, talk about learning the guitar intro to Blackbird, I've Just Seen a Face has a lot of that, too. That's an incredible intro. I'm looking through you. However, I really want the U.S. stereo version of I'm Looking Through You because it's got the false start, which extends the intro. Mm -hmm. And somehow I think of that false start as kind of the intro. You know, like, da 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 Da, 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 da. So, you know, it's, uh, it's actually, for me, a better intro than <laughs> if they had chopped that off, which is what was intended. Darren had said rain, so I'll just flip that over and use paperback writer. Right. Um, there you've got this sort of, you know, multiple vocal thing, which they used a few times, you know. I mean, their vocal harmonies were a really important part of their sound. And in paperback writer, you get it right at the beginning with, you know, several strands of the vocals coming in. And then it just rocks right into the song. Uh, even though Darren mentioned it, I can't not include And Your Bird Can Sing because that is just such an incredibly joyous sounding intro. Um, plus, as a kid, I watched Beatles cartoons. And yeah. last season, the Beatles cartoons had And Your Bird Can Sing as, as its theme. So uh, that really kind of imprinted itself in my brain. Um, also, the first album that I ever bought with my own money was uh yesterday and today when i was a kid and then your bird could sing us on that and used to get played an awful lot you know, zooming through lucy and love me reader and strawberry fields and landing upon baby or a rich man that nice. has a really interesting intro because it's got that weird you know with claveline or some whatever that instrument is Violine. Clavioline, hmm? clavioline. Something like that. Um, but, you know, it's kind of a, a funny sound that we hadn't really heard before. You know, you're thinking, is, is, is that an oboe? It's not an oboe. It's, you know, what what is that thing? Um, but it also, you know, it has a, a sort of interesting percussion sound, too. It almost sounds backwards, you know. That Unusual kind of sounds. All McCartney's chugging bass. <clears throat> Strumming yeah. the dead, no, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, my guitar gently weeps. You know, Paul on piano, George on guitar, Ringo drumming, then Eric Clapton coming in with the first of his little riffs right before the the vocal comes in. It's pretty, you know, subtly powerful intro. Yeah, I have to include all too much as well. Um because I was thinking of that one as doing double duty as well because of the feedback, like, I feel fine. Mm -hmm. uh, except this is, you know, with I feel fine, the feedback was an accident. And here you get the impression that the feedback was absolutely deliberate. And, you know, he's playing with it, you know, with like the whammy bar, I guess, to to make it shift its melody. And, you know, it, it, be, it becomes kind of... Melodic feedback. I mean, the only other person who used that was Hendrix. Um, so that's kind of a nice touch. And then, you know, then the organ comes in and it's, 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 it's really an extended intro and it has a lot going on. 
And finally, Across the Universe. Just love that gentle acoustic guitar sound uh, in that. It, it's up there in a way with Blackbird and I've just seen a face. It's, it's a little more subtle. Um, and uh, and it's, it's just a song I love generally anyway. So wanted to include it since it has a nice intro. So are we going to go around and do extras or? Uh... <laughs> we could... I, I don't have any extras. Oh, you were you really held it to ten? Oh, uh, well, twelve. But yeah, that was that. <clears throat> those were the ones. I listen. What what do I feel blew people's heads off when they heard these songs for the first time in the sixties? These unorthodox introductions, um, which may have become normal, uh, the norm as years passed, the ones that are iconic, you know, uh, like revolution to me is, you know, like I said before, one note, one second of it, you know what it is. And the ones that are favorites of mine kind of all mushed together. Um, so is that what I was going for? And when I quickly went through, you know, track listings on the album and I had around 10, I stopped. So there's probably a couple more that I could have included. You know, I thought about um, the force of the guitar at the beginning of uh, She Said, She Said. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, and But then again, it was just a riff, and the riff was common, so I took it all. I didn't leave it on my list, opening with a riff. Or uh, for the Beatles to blast off a song with horns, got to get you into my life. Mm -hmm. Uh, unique for them, but was it really unique? Eh, well, all right, take it off. Um, so there's others that could probably have gone in in there. There's the way, the way of what the, about like, help? What? What about help? Help the is US like, version with the James Bond intro. No, I do it without yeah. the James Bond intro. <laughs> I mean, that the beginning to uh, help, which just where they jump right in with the well, uh, you know, with the the, the the title of the song. Is similar to some of the other ones we picked that mm -hmm. had that open up with the vocals. So that's why I didn't put help in. And I didn't put in a hard day's night except because I knew you guys were going to pick it. Mm -hmm. It was an obvious easy pick uh, because there isn't another. I mean, it's probably one of the best known single chords to open up a song. Definitely. You know, ever. So that was a little obvious. I left it off. How about uh, when I get home? That has kind of a cool, uh, hmm. yeah, that's pretty know, different. Eleanor Rigby does too, but I think, um, I think that got eliminated because it's more or less the chorus in a way, you know. But what's what's wrong with the fact of starting a song with the chorus? That that's what makes nothing's it. wrong with it. I just needed to <laughs> limit, <the list>. yeah, <laughs> uh, that a lot of that came from George Martin, yeah. George Martin wanted She Loves You to start with the chorus of the song. And that's also why Can't Buy Me Love starts with the chorus. Mm -hmm. How about Love You Too? That's an unusual intro. Um, we've Some of these we talked about, you know, intros unlike what you would hear on other pop records of the time. And that sure is one. I had a whole bunch here, but I especially like to point out the songs that start off with just vocals. And mm -hmm. You mentioned paperback writer um, because the harmonies come in so soon. So is Nowhere Man. <laughs> From the first note, it's all right. harmonies. You're going to yeah. lose that girl starts with uh, mm -hmm. just vocals. Um, and you mentioned help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think all the ones that start cold we've mentioned so far. Um, and for iconic guitar and piano riffs i also put drive my car in there mm -hmm. um it's it's a very unusual introduction because there's like an extra beat in there <laughs> i don't know how quite to describe it but it's not like a strict four four beat somehow there's some extra beat that gets slipped into there and i'm sure I, it's kind of <laughs> difficult for a band to really copy that mm. um kansas city i think has a real cool introduction um for piano, I also put Hey Bulldog. That's a great riff right there. Um, I also included um, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Sure. Because um, 
those notes really give the song a dreamy effect to start off with. Mm -hmm. And I also put in She Said, She Said. I love the bleeding guitar at the very beginning there. And Enya Burke and Sing is so cool because of the dual guitar playing between Paul and George on there. You know, it goes on for quite a while with just, you know, two notes in harmony with each other constantly on guitar. It's really unusual, I guess, for its time. Uh, someone who hasn't gotten any respect in this conversation, but did earlier in the show, um, both Octopus's Garden and Don't Pass Me By actually have pretty interesting intros. Hmm. Yeah, what's going on with Don't Pass Me By? Can you shed a little light on the intro there? Someone messing around on the piano and... In the organ, yeah. Basically, it is. You know, there's a number of things that are really sort of messing around that became intros. I mean, uh, Opla de Opla Da, you know, the story is that John just sort of came walking into the studio and went up to the piano and just did that intro. It wasn't really part of the song before that. And they liked it, so they kept it. Hmm. So have we have we covered what we wanted to cover? Anything else anyone wants to add? No, I don't. I think we're uh, I think we've I think we've covered them all. Okay. So then let us go around, give our contact information, and we'll start with Darren. All right. Well you can hear me on WFUV Monday through Thursday night starting at 10 p.m. till 2 a.m. And Saturday afternoons from 1 till 4 in New York City, 90.7 FM. Um, and you can also stream at WFUV.org, O-R-G. Um, we have an app as well, another uh, uh, convenient way to listen. Uh, get the app. And if you have a smart speaker, they claim, which I don't have one, just ask your smart speaker to play WFUV, and it will. Um, and you can look for me on Facebook at Darren DeVivo and Darren DeVivo, WFU, uh, WFUV DJ and Beatles podcaster is the other kind of auxiliary page. Um, and if, while I'm talking about Facebook pages, again, I, I can't stress this enough. Please join our newer Facebook page, which is Things We Said Today video podcast. I believe is the name of it. Uh, and we're going to be shutting down at least one, if not both of our older Facebook pages. So I think I have to put another update uh, and explain again to folks who may have missed it the first time. We don't want to disconnect you, but eventually we will shut down the older Facebook pages. So keep that in mind. And that's all, uh, that's all for me. Okay, Ken. Okay, if you would like to get in touch with me directly, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. My radio show, Every Little Thing, uh, the newest one that I produced is a Beatles travelogue show. And all the song titles have either cities, states, or countries in the song titles. So we take a trip around the world with the Beatles for an hour. And if you'd like to hear my radio show, um, the easiest way to do it where it's on demand is from the radio station WFDU. That's Fairleigh Dickinson University's radio station in New Jersey. I'm actually wearing a shirt from them right here. You never get to see what's underneath <laughs> my neck here whenever we're doing our show, but it's well, a FDU shirt. Right? We're thankful. We're thankful for that. <laughs> I mean, what clothes I have. Underneath. Oh, okay. Good. Okay. Ken does his shit the show with no pants on, by the way. I want give it away <laughs> you're giving the game away i would wear an fuv shirt if i got a free one from someone that i know um also so go to wfdu's uh website which is wfdu.fm look up their archival shows type in every little thing and you will find two shows there that you can listen to the two most recent shows that they've aired on the station and they're both available each one for two weeks okay wfdu.fm um, also my other talk show podcast, talk more talk next Monday, we'll be doing a show on Ringo's new EP crooked boy. And that's with kid O'Toole, Joe Mayo and Tom Hunyadi. The show airs live on YouTube 
at Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast, 9 p.m. Eastern Time. And that's next Monday, which is the 29th of April. Okay. On my own YouTube channel, which is Ken Michaels Radio, I just did an interview with Jude Kessler, who's the author of several books on John Lennon. The most recent one, which is Volume 5, is called Shades of Life Part 1. And we actually did a number nine dream show on my channel. I haven't done that for quite a while. That's when uh, my guest picks a Beatle that he or she wants to talk about. In this case, it was John. Um, and I picked three categories to talk about where John is concerned. And she has to name her top three in each category. So you get three answers in three categories. So you have nine answers. Hence, number nine dream. That's mm -hmm. the most recent um, interview on, uh, on my channel. I also did an interview with Tom Brennan who helped to put together this new CD of yep. Pete Demos, Gwent Gardens. Uh, you can actually win a copy of the CD. I only have one to give away, but it's part of my uh, Beatles trivia contest that you can find on my website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com. Okay, if you can, please subscribe to Ken Michaels Radio, the YouTube channel, mm -hmm. and also Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast on YouTube. All right. I think that's everything. Okay. If you're in New York in May, when Paul's Eyes of the Hurricane exhibition opens at the Brooklyn Museum, get the recorded walking tour. I contributed to that, spoke generally about Paul and the Beatles, uh, and I discussed a few of the pictures specifically, and they're editing that into the whole production well, uh, so I haven't heard the the finished edit. They're using some of Paul's descriptions of the photographs from previous versions of this show. Christine Feldman Barrett is also on it. Also, Debbie Gensler has contributed to it, and it sounds like it potentially could be an an interesting audio tour. Uh, so, if you go, let me know. So you can reach me on Facebook, either at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remix. There also is a McCartney Legacy Facebook page. And you can email all of us at things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. Don't forget to follow our Facebook page, Things We Said Today video podcast. As Darren pointed out, that's the new one. Forget about the old ones. That's the place to go. So, anyway, this has been fun. Thanks for listening. And for Ken Michaels and Darren DeVivo, I'm Alan Cozen, and we'll see you next time. Take care. Take care, everyone.